Chapter 12 talks about incapacitating sex offenders. So let's start by talking about uh, sexually violent predator legislation. And this is basically um, a recycled version of mentally disordered sex offender laws that were in effect during the 1930s. And these statutes were passed based on the idea that sexually deviant behavior resulted from some type of disorder that is actually treatable. And so most of these laws are passed in a reactionary manner. We are still really not able to predict dangerousness with much accuracy. So how do we define a sexually violent predator? It's usually someone who's been convicted of or charged with a sexually violent offense. They also have to suffer from a mental abnormality or personality disorder and be likely to engage in future acts of sexual violence as a result of the mental abnormality or personality disorder. So they can't have just a predisposition of violence. There has to be proof of past sexually violent behavior and a current mental condition. So the most common mental disorders for SVPs are paraphilias or personality disorders. A Florida study found statistically significant predictors of SVP status included pedophilia, alcohol or substance abuse, a nonspecific paraphilia, personality disorder, and um, ASPD, antisocial personality disorder. The Adam Walsh Act provides grants for the development of SVP legislation, and they're named after child victims. So how does this process work? First, the offender is referred to the court within three months of release from prison. The district attorney then files a petition, and a hearing is held to determine probable cause whether or not the sex offender is an SVP. The sex offender does have due process rights at the hearing, and if probable cause is established, then they're going to be transferred to a facility for an evaluation. During this evaluation, a risk assessment is going to be performed, and if they're deemed dangerous, a trial will be held within 45 days. Now, the standard of proof to commit somebody varies by jurisdiction, but a unanimous verdict that the sex offender is an SVP leads to a special commitment center until they are no longer a danger. They can be petitioned to a less restrictive alternative once they no longer fit the definition of an SVP. Uh, the hearing is set and the sex offender is not present but does have a right to counsel. They have to agree to abide by the conditions in the judgment, uh, that they're involved in a treatment program, that the treatment provider reports to the court regularly, and the facility must be secure enough to ensure community protection. And then this is reviewed annually until they are considered rehabilitated. Now, states have a different uh, variations here in these SVP statutes. So different um, standards are, of dangerousness are used as a threshold for commitment, um, but the standard of proof is generally beyond a reasonable doubt, although others do use the clear and convincing evidence standard. As far as how long they're committed for, they're committed until they're, quote, rehabilitated. Um, some can apply for release, whereas in other programs, they're evaluated every two years. Um, some, are, some of these facilities are wings within the prison, and some are special facilities. But it costs nearly $100,000 per year. Uh, and the, the statutes here vary um, from state to state as well. So first of all, one of the things we have to do in this process is to assess the risk that the offender opposes. Most clinicians use what's called the static 99 in conjunction with a clinical assessment. Uh, so these are actuar actuarial tools, and they're based on static factors. So static factors are things that do not change about you. Um, so a past criminal record doesn't change. It's always there. Um, if an offender displays characteristics similar to a class of offenders we know to recidivate, we assume that they'll recidivate as well. Uh, but the accuracy here is very low, and we cannot predict dangerousness with any certainty. We also want to think about the ethical issues of incapacitating someone who shows future risk of violence but has not committed a future crime. And we want to remember that sex offenders have a low base rate of reoffending. So once you're committed, you're supposed to undergo treatment. Uh, there's three problems with this, though. First of all, the treatment might not be appropriate for you. For you. Uh, you may decide not to participate. And if you are being genuine in your treatment and disclosing, then you may be disclosing things that would prohibit you from being released. So it's not really even in your own best interest. About two-thirds participate in treatment, but very few are deemed rehabilitated and released. Most of the problems are cognitive behavioral problems, uh, and this treatment is only likely to be effective if the risks and needs of offenders are accurately assessed and the, the treatment can actually address those needs. So a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy programs exclude people based on certain criteria. 
if you're violent, if you have a high level of psychopathy or mental disorders. And most SVPs have these issues. They might also have other special needs like neurological impairments or developmental disabilities. Um, and so basically this legislation then requires that they participate in a treatment that they would not have otherwise qualified for. Treatment here is voluntary, but if you don't participate, you won't be rehabilitated. And if you're not rehabilitated, you won't be released. So there is some coercion here to participate. Um, for some offenders, there is no program that can address their needs, and some programs don't even offer treatment. So in order to be rehabilitated, you have to fully address your offending behavior, but full disclosure could reduce the chances of actually being released. So basically, your risk level is determined based upon risk assessment, and these, again, are based on static characteristics, which will always be high. So if we're looking at um, your risk based on things you can't change about yourself, how do those, those things don't change? Your risk won't go down. Um, there's also little opportunity to really modify your behavior while you're confined. So basically this becomes a subjective process and it's largely dependent on the clinical assessment. Furthermore, then the psychologist who approves the release is responsible for any actions the offender takes once in the community. So think about the risk that that psychologist is taking and how likely you think they are to say that someone is ready to be released if they know that they're responsible for whatever that offender does once they're released. So let's think about some legal arguments. First of all, involuntary civil commitment was supposed to be a last resort. Um, statutes do require proof of a mental disability, um, but this has continually withstood constitutional challenges. So in 1975 in O'Connor v. Donaldson, they examined civil commitment and indefinite commitment. And they said that a finding of mental illness alone does not justify confinement. You also have to be a danger to yourself or someone else. In Fucci v. Louisiana in 92, the court held that offenders can only be detained involuntarily if they have a mental illness or mental abnormality, even if they remain a danger to themselves or others. So if you can find someone who doesn't have a mental disability, you're basically uh, making hospital prison. Inri Young in 93 found that an individual who was not incarcerated at the time of referral must have committed a recent overt act to indicate that they may be need to be committed. Um, Inri Linhan in 94 confirmed Inri Young, uh, and they petitioned for a writ of certiorari, but before that, the court had decided in Kansas v. Hendricks. Uh, and in Kansas v. Hendricks, this is a pretty well-known case regarding civil commitment. The offender here in this case had attempted but never completed any treatment programs, and he basically said he couldn't control his urges and that he would offend again. Um, but the argument that was being made here was that this was ex post facto punishment. This was the first time the court said that pedophilia could be considered a mental abnormality. Uh, prior to this, the court did not consider paraphilias, personality disorders, or ASPD to be mental abnormalities. The statute was upheld in uh, Kansas v. Hendricks. It was considered not vague and not ex post facto. And the court dismissed the idea that the term mental abnormality was vague. The court never required the use of special nomenclature, and it does require a pre-commitment finding of dangerousness that links to a mental abnormality or personality disorder. Once Hendricks was committed, though, there was no treatment. So this set a precedent, and other states began proposing similar legislation. 2002 in Kansas v. Crane, the SVP could be civilly committed on the basis of emotional or personality disorder rather than complete volitional impairment. All the court, the court said that the only thing that had to be proven was serious difficulty in controlling their behavior. And in U.S. v. Comstock, the court upheld the federal government's right to civilly commit under, necessary, under the Necessary and Proper Clause. So what are the goals and how effective is SVP legislation? Well, the goal is to protect the public from sex offenders at high risk to reoffend, and they try to do this through incapacitation and rehabilitation. Uh, rehabilitation is designed to help the offender, and the incapacitation piece is to protect society. But there's little evidence that this is effective at protecting the community. And we also have to weigh the cost of this legislation. So first of all, there's ethical issues of essentially incarcerating somebody for a crime they have yet to commit. It's also very expensive. Um, so some basically say that incapacitation here is just a pretext of punishment because you're being incapacitated for something you may commit. And we know that uh, we don't really know how, uh, how helpful any of this treatment is. Treatment in the community does reduce recidivism, but most SVPs would be excluded from that type of treatment. 
A commitment to a secure facility can also um, really inhibit those treatment efforts. It removes the responsibility for the conduct from the offender and applies that they're unable to respond to any sanctions. This may in turn then kind of give them the idea that they're not really responsible for their own behavior. Also because um, so few people have been released, only 10% um, have been released since 1990, it's difficult to assess whether or not this, you know, whether or not this approach is even working. And that wraps up incapacitating sex offenders.